Good afternoon. Good afternoon, masters, deans, colleagues, friends, and the class of 2017. My name is Marichelle Gentry, and I'm a senior associate dean of Yale College, dean of student affairs, and dean of freshman affairs. On behalf of all of my colleagues in Yale College, I'd like to welcome you to this orientation keynote address. And this, the very first time you've all been in the same place as a class. Congratulations. At this time, I ask that you disable all cell phones and electronic devices. Thank you. And now it gives me great pleasure to introduce Mary Miller, the Dean of Yale College and Sterling Professor of History of Art. This past Saturday, you all had the opportunity to hear Dean Miller when she gave her freshman assembly address. Now I'd like to tell you a bit about her. Before taking on the deanship, Dean Miller served as Master of Saybrook College for nearly a decade until she became Dean of Yale College in 2008. Dean Miller has served as Chair of the Department of History of Art, Chair of the Council on Latin American Studies, Director of Graduate Studies and Archaeological Studies, and as a member of the Steering Committee of the Women Faculty Forum at Yale. Dean Miller is the preeminent scholar of the art of the ancient New World. For her work on ancient Mexico and the Maya, Dean Miller has won national recognition, including a Guggenheim Fellowship. She was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 1994. She is scheduled to deliver the Slade Lectures at Cambridge University during the academic year 2014-2015. Serving as the Dean of Yale College is a major undertaking. And Dean Miller has led progressively and expertly with character, dignity, and grace. My colleagues and I often marvel at how she's able to stay on top of her game scholastically while serving as Dean of Yale College. But she has, having completed several major book projects since becoming Dean. Her latest book entitled The Spectacle of the Late Maya Court, Reflections on the Murals of Bonampak, arrived at our office a few days ago, a few weeks ago, excuse me. It already has been deemed destined to become a standard reference for future scholarship on the pivotal role of images in the highly charged political atmosphere of the late classic Maya realm. This very important book also has been labeled a masterful culmination of over 30 years of Dean Miller's engagement with these paintings. Dean Miller has many interests. She's often spotted on campus attending student plays, concerts, and sporting events of all kind. She's an avid squash player, and she also enjoys baking delicious goodies and knitting very beautiful garments. I hope that you all get to know Dean Miller during your time here at Yale. I now ask her to come to, to introduce our speaker. I'm stepping on the stool and bringing down the microphone. Uh, welcome, 2017. I just feel as though I saw so many of you at the academic fair over the past couple of hours, and it's been a wonderful afternoon to walk around and speak with students in, who are meeting with directors of undergraduate studies, and then out on the sidewalks as you're thinking about the smorgasbord of Yale that lies ahead of you. I'd like to invite you to, uh, if, you have a, if you're wearing a jacket or a sweater, if you'd like to take a second to remove it, it, you might be more comfortable here because it is so much hotter than it was on Saturday when we last met in this room. Do I have any takers? Thanks, I know you'll be a little bit more comfortable. And it is a sticky afternoon, but we fortunately have provided this rather stiff piece of paper, which seems to have come in 
quite handy. It's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Tamar Sabo Gendler. She's the Vincent J. Scully Professor of Philosophy. She's chair of the Department of Philosophy. And now I'm about to give you a list that I think, um, I, I hope, I promise not to quiz you on, but just think about it. She's professor of philosophy, professor of humanities, professor of cognitive science, and professor of psychology. How did she get there? Well, professor, and you'll notice that I just used the word professor, not doctor. Most faculty in Yale College are known uh, not by the medical term, which we tend to reserve for people who have MD after their name. Uh, Professor Gendler started her career just as you did on a hot, sticky week in New Haven, um, possibly wondering, like you, where the road ahead would lead. Well, after she graduated, and yes, in continuing a series of shout outs, she was in Pearson College. And she had a double major in philosophy. Um, in humanities, rather, a new major that had just been born at the time that she was a student here, um, and the, the joint major of mathematics and philosophy. That road led her after Yale eventually, and we forgive her that she went to Harvard for her PhD, um, which she earned in philosophy. After Harvard, she went on to teach other places before coming back to Yale in 2006. I'm always touched by the fact that she spent part of a, most of a decade in my home stomping grounds of upstate New York, teaching at Syracuse and Cornell. Uh, she came back in 2006, and she has been uh, making wonderful waves ever since. Professor Gendler studies philosophical psychology, epistemology, now I have to look at my list, metaphysics and aesthetics, and she often writes about the beliefs between, uh, the differences between the beliefs we think we hold and the ones we actually hold. Now, it may turn out that some of you have already watched part of, or all of her lectures on Open Yale, so you already have some idea of what she might say to you. But let me just add that this work has won major prizes and awards and she is right now, in this moment, the most cited woman philosopher under the age of 50. This is an extraordinary achievement. That's not on her CV yet, but she has to be very careful what she says to me. You never know where that information is going to turn up next. Last year, the students in Yale College nominated her for the Sidoni Miskimen Prize for Excellence in Teaching in the Humanities. It's one of the university's highest distinctions and a mark of, one of, of being one of Yale's great teachers. But you might have guessed this already from the name attached to hers. She's the Vincent Scully Professor. And the Vincent Scully Professorship was established in 1998 by members of the class of 1958 in honor of the professor who had made their lives so, who had changed their lives so much by the way he taught them. They sought to honor him. Uh, and there have only been three Vincent Scully professors, and I'm kind of touched to say that I was the first one. We won't mention the second, and Tamar is the third. So it's very nice to be able to offer this link between us. As you start on this road yourselves, you may be wondering where the path will take you. You're going to have plenty of time to answer that question, but what you'll learn in the next few days and over the next few years is that you'll find excellent guides wherever you look for them. This afternoon's speaker, one of Yale's most accomplished scholars and teachers, is one of those guides. Are your pockets empty? Are your contradictions there? I don't have any pockets, so I, I uh, but uh, please, I'm just thinking, I have no pockets this afternoon. Maybe that's a good thing. But I know you will join me in welcoming our guest in, as she uh, turns to her address, keeping contradiction in your pockets, Professor Gendler.
Thank you so much, Dean Gentry. Thank you so much, Dean Miller. And welcome, welcome, welcome members of the class of 2017. As a proud member of the Yale College class of 1987, I welcome you to the best reunion cohort ever, the twos and the sevens. Welcome aboard. Can you believe you're here? I mean it, really. Look around you. You're sitting in Woolsey Hall on the campus of Yale University, surrounded by 1,359 of the most amazing and engaging and exciting young people on the planet. You hail from all 50 states and from 49 different countries. You're from Argentina and Bulgaria and China and there's no one from Denmark or Djibouti. But you're from Ethiopia and France and Ghana and Hong Kong and India and Japan and, don't worry, and Senegal and Trinidad and the United Arab Emirates, though no one from Yemen or Zimbabwe. You play the violin and the marimba and the gamelan and the electric guitar. You've won math competitions and poetry prizes. You've built award-winning haunted houses and toured with teams of professional clowns. You've tended gardens. You've worked on oil rigs. You've organized peace protests. You've served in the Navy. You, class of 2017, are an extraordinarily diverse group. Look around the room again. This is a room full of people who will become your classmates for the next four years and your friends for the next 40. This is a place where your predecessors have sat and your successors will sit. And this is a space like so many other spaces on this magnificent, sometimes overwhelming, sometimes intimidating, often magical campus that is yours to explore, yours to learn from, yours to transform, and yours to make your own. So to set you out on the path of making this space your own, let me honor the person for whom my chair was named and tell you a little bit about the building where you're sitting. Woolsey Hall, that is, this space, is one of a trio of buildings known as the Bicentennial Buildings. These buildings were built, as the name suggests, to honor the Bicentennial of Yale in 1901. And they were the very first buildings on this campus that belonged to Yale as a university as a whole, rather than to one of Yale's constituent units, the Sheffield Scientific School, the Yale College, the Yale Law School, and so on. Their goal was to provide for the campus the first large-scale secular gathering space, a space where the entire community could assemble on common, neutral ground. Woolsey Hall, this grand, soaring space of coming together, was named in honor, in honor of Theodore Dwight Woolsey, who was president of Yale from 1846 to 1871, and who had died in 1899, just two years before the Bicentennial Buildings were commemorated. Woolsey had been a transformative figure in Yale's history. A scholar of Greek, he was known to his colleagues as a man of original and creative scholarly powers. He had spent time abroad at German universities of the era, and when he returned to America, he was committed to bringing the rigors of classical education to the young men of New Haven. So the members of the class of 1902, who would have sat in this room when it was brand new, these are contemporaries roughly of your great, 
great, great grandparents, would have recognized along the ceiling here the images of the nine muses who grace the ceiling. These are Melpomene, the muse of tragedy, Calliope, the muse of epic poetry, Polyhymnia, the muse of the sacred, Euterpe, who inspires music, Erato, who inspires the lyrics of love, Talia, the muse of comedy, Urania, the muse of astronomy, Cleo, the muse of history, Terpsichore, the muse of dance, and at the center, Athena, goddess of wisdom. The goal of the architects who designed this room, the same team who went on to design the New York Public Library a decade later, was to create a space where myth and reality, past and present, come together, where the universality of human experience is evoked through the magic of music and the grandeur of the heavens. The other two buildings in the bicentennial trio of structures are also places of coming together. The Yale Commons Dining Hall with its Hogwarts beams and its long communal tables is designed as a place of gathering, a place where affiliations fall away. And the Memorial Rotunda, that grand circular fulcrum that joins Commons to Wolsey Hall, the hinge that connects Science Hill to the downtown campus. That space is even more powerly, powerfully a place where past and present are joined. Engraved on the walls of that rotunda, through which you will pass almost daily in your time at Yale, are the names of the students and alumni who died as soldiers in each of America's wars over the last two centuries, from the Revolutionary War in the 1770s to the Vietnam War two centuries later. Maya Lin, an, the 1981 graduate who, inspired by that space, designed the Vietnam War Memorial in Washington, D.C., writes of the power of passing through those hallways. She says, I have never been able to resist touching those names cut into the marble walls. No matter how busy or crowded the place is, a sense of quiet, of reverence, always surrounds those names. Some of you may feel these spaces in the ways that I'm describing them. You may feel comfortable, even uplifted, by the grand, towering, symbol-laden formality of these rooms and halls. Others of you may find them overwhelming, even intimidating. You may feel the exclusionary weight of Yale's massive wooden doors and its heavy iron gates. You may feel discomfort navigating an unfamiliar place imbued with the markers of traditional privilege. You may be profoundly aware that many of us in this room, including all three of us on this stage, would not have been admitted to Yale in its early years. Yale is indeed a work in progress, and there is much progress still to be made. Both of these ways of responding to the campus, the feeling of welcome and the feeling of anxiety, are legitimate. Both are important, and the capacity for both is inside all of you. There's an ancient Jewish teaching that says that every human being should carry in their pockets two pieces of paper. On one of them, you should write the words, for my sake was the world created. And on the other, you should write, 
I am but dust and ashes. The teaching continues by telling you to reach for each of these papers at the moment that you're feeling the opposite. So when you're feeling lowly or depressed or discouraged or overwhelmed, you should pull from your pocket the paper that says the world was created for my sake. And when you're feeling high and mighty, superior and arrogant, you should pull from your pocket the paper that says dust and ashes are all that I am. You will find, all of you, the need for both of these papers during your time at Yale. There will be moments when you will be convinced that you do not belong here, that you are a hopeless fraud, that the admissions office made a terrible mistake in not eliminating your application in the very first round. And for moments like that one, you need to create for yourself something that does what that first piece of paper says. That is, something that reminds you that you do indeed belong here, that Yale was created for your sake, and that if you are feeling overwhelmed or out of place or lonely or isolated, that this entire community, this room full of your amazing classmates, the upper class students that you will meet in your colleges and classrooms and in your singing groups and on your athletic teams, the campus staff that files and cleans and cooks and guards, the graduate students and faculty who will join you in your seminars and laboratories and field sites and studios, the librarians, the coaches, the cooks, the counselors, the doctors, the deans and the masters, we are here for you. For your sake was this campus community created. But of course, though the campus community was created for you, it was also created for you, and for you, and for you, and for you, and for you. It was created for you as a plural. Vosotros in Spanish, vous in French, Sazi in Turkish, y'all in Alabama. For you, and me, and him, and her, and them, and us, for all of us. And that's where the second piece of paper comes in. The second piece of paper reminds you that you are but dust and ashes. That is, that you are composed of the same matter as your fellow creatures, and that you, like them, are a transient inhabitant of this planet. You are made of the same materials, dust and ashes, protons and electrons, hydrogen and helium, cells and more cells, as every other living being. So when, at the moment that the first piece of paper has raised you so far above those around you that you begin to lose your sense of commonality with them, your sense of connectedness to them, your sense of responsibility for them, it's time for the second piece of paper. Dust and ashes is all that you are. So that's one pair of inconsistencies that you can keep in your pockets to guide you during your time at Yale. But there's another pair inspired by the first that I've already mentioned that I also advise you to keep on hand. So here's another version of the parable. Every human being should carry in their pockets two pieces of paper. On one of them, you should write the words, all others experience the world as I do. And on the other, you should write, my perspective is mine alone. There are moments that you will need to pull each of these from your pockets. There are times when you will assume too much commonality with those around you, and times when you will assume too little. The assumption that everyone's experience is the same as my own is the classic mistake of infancy. 
a baby who has covered her eyes so that she can't see you is profoundly convinced that you can't see her. It's a major developmental milestone, typically reached only at the age of four or so, to recognize that somebody else's beliefs could differ from your own. But the task remains a difficult one, even for adults. A standard task in psychology studies involves sitting people, two people, on opposite sides of a table. So I would be on this side, and you would be on that one. And putting between us a vertical sort of tic-tac-toe board made out of shelves that forms a grid on which different objects are placed. So between us would be a kind of crisscross, and in each of the cells, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, would be placed a different object. So for example, there might be a small rubber duck in this cell, and a medium rubber duck in that one, and a small stuffed bear in the third, and so on. If you're having trouble visualizing this scenario, to some extent, I've already made my point. And you have a picture in your head, a perspective on the world that you're trying to share with someone else, it's incredibly difficult to figure out just what you have to tell them to bring them to understand the image that you're trying to convey. And this case is no exception. But I'm hoping that at least a few of you have some sort of picture in your mind of this setup, since I want to describe for you the rest of the experiment. I promise that it has something to do with the second two pieces of paper, and I promise that even if you aren't following the details, the point will still be clear. The way the study continues is by giving one of the subjects instructions to tell the other subject to do something. So for example, you might be told to say to me, take the large rubber duck out of its cell and put it on the table beside the tic-tac-toe board. And my job is simply to do what you've asked me to do. Sounds pretty easy. But there's something about the setup, which I didn't tell you yet, which is that some of the cells are blocked out on one of their side by a little piece of opaque cardboard. So for example, the center cell might be visible to me, but not to you. And I would know that because I could see behind the object that I see in the center cell, the occluding piece of cardboard that prevents you from seeing, for example, the large rubber duck that's in that center cell. So I might realize that although from my perspective, there are three rubber ducks, a small one, a medium one, and a large one, from yours, there are only two, since the large one is blocked from your view. What this means is that I should realize that when you say, take the large rubber duck out of its cell and put it on the table, you mean that I should take what I think of as the medium rubber duck and put it on the table. If I'm understanding your words in the way that you are using them, I should move the duck that I think is the medium one because I know that that's the duck that you think is large. It turns out that this simple task is awfully hard to do. Children are terrible at it. And even adults, even adults who say to themselves what you can see and what I can see, tend to reach first for the wrong object and correct themselves only along the way. And if you distract them by having them do some other task at the same time, they are just as bad as children. The story has several morals. The first and simplest is that rubber ducks come in all sorts of sizes. The second, which I already mentioned, is that it's often difficult to describe something to someone else 
so that they understand clearly what you're trying to describe. Even when what you're trying to say is vividly clear in your own mind. And the third and most important is that our natural tendency in many circumstances to assume that others share our perspective on the world, that they are just like us, that we don't need to correct for what is idiosyncratic in our experiences, may be profoundly mistaken. Of course, we're consciously aware of all sorts of differences among us. Consciously, I may realize that you watch MSNBC while I prefer Fox, that you think Edward Snowden is a hero while I think he's a criminal, that you are obsessed with opera while I'm obsessed with base jumping, that you love to dance katakali while I prefer to twerk. I will not. But when we're engaged in real-time, moment-to-moment interactions, we may lose track of the ways that we are assuming commonality where there may be difference. I may assume, tacitly, through neglecting to mention it, that because my gender identity matches the biological sex that I was assigned at birth, that yours does too. You may assume tacitly, by not mentioning it, that because your life takes its meaning and structure from a religious tradition, that mine does too. You may assume tacitly that just because you think our interaction is a fully consensual one, that I do too. And I may assume tacitly that because I intend this address to be inclusive and welcoming, that you are experiencing it in that way. In fact, I almost made exactly that mistake. I thought how wonderful it would be to welcome the members of Pearson College to Yale University. And then I realized that I was leaving out 11 tenths of the room. So Berkeley and Branford and Calhoun and Davenport and Stiles and J.E. and Morrison, Saybrook and Selman and T.D. and Trumbull, welcome to Yale. So that's why you need that little piece of paper in your pocket. The one that says, assume that my perspective is mine alone. Sometimes using we is a way of being inclusive. We're all in this together. But sometimes it's a way of tacitly excluding. And excluding in the most painful way because it doesn't involve the acknowledgement of exclusion. We think thus and such. We feel so and so. That we, like this room, may have different meanings for different people. So take that perspective piece of paper from your pocket when you are trying to genuinely listen and genuinely speak. Realize that you may be assuming commonality when there's actually diversity, that you may be assuming consensus when there's actually dissent. Open yourself to the possibility that there are novel perspectives to be gained from your classmates, from the historical works that you read, from multiple disciplines that provide you with differing approaches to questions that matter. If your perspective is yours alone, there is much to be learned from the perspectives of others. At the same time, that assumption of difference may go too far. Yale is filled, as I mentioned earlier, with teams of people who are here for you. Professors and masters and deans, librarians and coaches and counselors, secretaries and janitors and dining hall staff, we are here for you. But we are here for you as fellow human beings, as a team of individuals engaged 
alongside you in a joint enterprise of tending and building and sustaining this incredible campus and the community that it supports. And we, like you, are dust and ashes, protons and electrons, cells and more cells. If it's a snowy winter morning and you pass a member of the grounds crew who's shoveling the sidewalk and you're feeling cold, she's probably feeling cold too. Look her in the eye and thank her. If you walk into your dining hall, greet the workers who cook your meals. Learn the names of those who clean your hallways. Thank those who file your forms. This is what the second piece of paper is for, to prevent you from losing track of the humanity of those around you. So keep those pairs of inconsistencies in your pocket. For my sake alone was the world created. I am but dust and ashes. My perspective is mine alone. All others experience the world as I do. And when the circumstances require, pull them from your pockets and read them aloud to yourself. Yale is yours, all of yours, to explore, yours to learn from, yours to transform, yours to make your own. And we are here for you, all of you. Welcome, class of 2017, to Yale University. Thank you, Professor Gindler, for those inspiring, thought-provoking words. Appreciate it. And now, as a part of this gathering, we'd like to introduce you to a long-standing Yale tradition, the singing of our alma mater, Bright College Years. You will sing it many times in your lives as students and then as alumni. So it's fitting that you begin your Yale career by singing it together for the very first time as a class. The words and tunes may be unfamiliar right now, but you'll soon learn them by heart. Representatives of the Yale Glee Club are here today to lead us. They will sing the first verse, and then I'll ask that you rise and sing both verses. You have been given a Yale handkerchief. It is our custom to wave it to, to from your right to left on the last line. So now let me call on Mr. Jeffrey Dauma, the director of the Yale Glee Club, and members of the Yale Glee Club. They will be accompanied on the organ by Mr. Simon Jacobs.
Thank you to the members of the Yale Glee Club. Thank you. This now here and concludes our event. Please now file out of Woolsey Hall to your colleges for your receptions and your dinners. Thank you very much. <laughs>